Before I start with my message this morning, I just want to kind of share a couple of things. I think unless you come from a Pentecostal or a charismatic background, a lot of times we don't understand just how powerful praise and worship can be. For the last four weeks, I have been fighting a cold, flu, whatever it is, it came from hell. And uh, God gave me the grace to go when I went to Cleveland. It's like it backed off a little bit. I was able to go down there and do the stuff I needed the minute the plane landed. It's like, it came back. Um, Last Sabbath after I preached, and I decided, my voice was sore before I started, I said, I'm going to sing. I'm going to do praise and worship anyway. I did it. Uh, that night I went home. I was running a low-grade fever, chilled all night. Sunday night comes. I'm sitting in my chair. I'm so sick. I don't want to hardly stand up. My wife, my, my mom called and said, I, I, I think I'm having a stroke. So we called an ambulance, got her up there, got to praying. God gave me the strength to do that. She frustrated the doctors. They thought it was a mini stroke. When they got done, it was a migraine. I mean, oh, God's good. Get home at midnight. I'm up the next morning and at the doctor's office by 8.30 saying, I need some TLC. I've been fighting this thing so long. And they gave me antibiotics. <clears throat> Didn't get any better. Uh, but some of the symptoms backed off. I was weak. Thursday, I had to drive up to Springfield to meet Mary and, and to do some things. And I'm driving down the highway so sick I can't hardly set up in the truck. Have a coffee fit to the place where almost black out. Tears running down my eyes. And I'm about to pull over and say, I can't do this. What raised up out of my spirit was more than ever before. Lord, I love you. More than ever before, Lord, I need you. It just raised up out of my spirit. And when it did, God filled that cab. All the symptoms left. Strength came into my body. You see, we think, we think the praise and worship is something to, that we do because we like these songs. And it's, you know, it's, it's not like listening to the radio when you're listening to, to whatever. The Word says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And when we need him the most is when you feel the worst. When things are going the worst... Paul and Silas didn't decide that they were going to have a jail ministry. And they went ahead and said, won't you lock me in here so that we can have a praise and worship session? They were in prison, and they began praising and worshiping God in the midst of prison. Why? They knew they needed the presence of God there. <clears throat> That's why it doesn't matter how sick I am or anything else going on. When it comes to praise and worship time, I, I, I have learned that if I will just yield to the Spirit of God and just praise him and worship him. It's not a sacrifice of praise when you feel good. It's not a sacrifice of praise when everything's going great. It's a sacrifice in your darkest hour. And uh, I have learned a lot from the black community that if you ever go to a black church, and I mean they're hitting it to the place where the roof is starting to go like this, they have had one bad week. And so they're seeking God and, and pushing into God for his presence to come. And I encourage you guys to do that. When In your darkest hour, learn to praise him. Learn to worship him. God will cause it to begin raising up out of your spirit. Now, what I want to deal with this morning, this has been going over and over again in my spirit all week. You know, last week we dealt with the witchcraft sting over America. And if you've been, if you're aware at all of anything that's going on, not only in America, but it's globally, there is a paradigm shift coming and a shift in the wrong way. That we're literally in a time that good becomes evil, evil becomes good, and all the crazies get all the whatever. And it is, it's, it's like, I don't understand. <laughs> I got a haircut this week and I like my barber. He says, you know, you may say this, and then God says this. I found I'm with God. That just makes you wrong. <laughs> I thought, how simple, you know. That if, if God says it, that settles it. But we're seeing that the whole world is trying to free themselves of this. And the scary part is a lot of the church is trying to free themselves of this. And so God began to deal with me on the cure for Babylon. How many know we need to have a cure? If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Revelation chapter 18, verses 3 and 4. <coughs>
It says, and for all, the, uh, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. And this is talking about Babylon, that God's getting ready to judge Babylon. Babylon has got to reach its zenith before God can judge it. One of the interesting things I found about the Amalekites, there was, there was a time when, you know, you were waiting for, for God's people to deal with this group, and God says, now, I've not let them deal with the Amalekites yet because their iniquity was not yet full. Even when God knows that they're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to go straight to hell, do not collect $200, do not pass go, God says, before my wrath can be poured, it has to be filled up. And before God can judge Babylon... Its iniquity has got to get full. It's got to reach its zenith before it can get full. Yet at the same time as it's reaching its zenith, God begins calling out to us that we need to walk away from it. But you know, this wasn't the first call out of Babylon. There was a guy named Abram lived in Babylon. God said, I want you to go someplace you've never seen and, and have something you've never ha had and you're going to leave everything that you ever had to do it. And so in a sense, a call to leave Babylon is a call like Abraham to walk with God. Now, I want to, I want to share a couple of things because really the, the, the call that we have, the cure that we need. How many know in the garden when Adam fell, he did not lose the church? He didn't lose his denomination. He didn't lose his church building. He didn't lose the power to cast out devils. He didn't lose the power to heal. He didn't lose all the things that we, he, he didn't lose his hymnal. I know that's hard for some Baptists to believe, but he did not lose his hymnal and it had to be rediscovered. What did he lose? In Genesis 3 and 8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. Every day, every evening, at the beginning of the new day, because biblically the day starts at sunset, not sunrise, God would come and he would walk with God. Guys, that's what he lost. When man fell, he lost his walk with God. Now, the sad part about it is we have multiple millions of Christians that are going to church this weekend that they may end up going church to church five times a week. They're involved in program after program after program after program, yet none of them walk with God. They walk with a church. They walk with a denomination. They walk with an association. They all kind of kind of go in the in the same direction i think a lot of churches are what the military used to call the old you know the old hueys they had during vietnam the joke used to be that it was one million parts flying in close in a close formation that really wasn't quite all together it was just kind of all in the same direction i think the church has been that way we've all been kind of we all kind of grouped together and we kind of all go in the same direction but the thing that we got to ask ourselves is the direction that that church is going is it the direction that god's going We have replaced so many things with the individual responsibility of walking with God. Now, over and over again, in Paul's writings, he, when he's looking at the Gentile church, he keeps on referring to Abraham. Abraham had to come out of Babylon. Not only did he have to come out of Babylon, he had to leave the family business because his daddy was an idol maker. So... He was, he, from the time that he was a child, he learned the craftsmanship of making idols one day to take over the family business. He had to leave all of that. But I, I want to go to Genesis 17 and 1 because this is the, this is the most powerful uh, event, I think, in Abraham's life. And sometimes reading it in the King James or even in English really does not do it justice. And it says, when Abram was 99 and, uh, 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I've shared this before. We read that in English, and it's like, hey, bud, 
I'm almighty God. Now you straighten up and you fly right because you're walking with me. And if you mess up one little iota, Jack, you're going to be a grease spot. Isn't that how a lot of us read that? It's like, ugh. The almighty God there is El Shaddai. El Shaddai has several different connotations. It's, I, I'm, I'm your mother, your father, I'm, I'm the, 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 the many-breasted one, I'm everything that you need. But the other side of, of El Shaddai is I'm also, if somebody comes against you, I'm also the destroyer. How many know that God is the God that is the judge of all? And the world's going to have to answer to him. And he said, listen, you're getting ready. You're going to leave everything. You need to know that I'm going to take care of you and that I'm going to protect you. So I introduce myself as El Shaddai. But then in the Hebrew, the Almighty says just three words. All, that, all the rest of that sentence after I am Almighty God is three Hebrew words. Halach panim tamim. Halach or halacha means to walk. Abraham, I'm calling you to walk with me. Now, Ab- the Adam used to walk with me in the garden, and I'm going to have you walk with me, and as you walk with me, we're going to walk out of Babylon together. I'm going to walk you into something new together, but you got to walk with me. And the very last one, the, the, the Tamim, where it says, be thou perfect. I, I, guys, I, until I looked this up in Hebrew, every time I read that, I just swallowed hard. Oop. Did you ever have a teacher in school that just, just watched every move you made, Ray, just to jump on you? I felt I had one, one time I felt like she was the chicken and I was the bug, you know what I mean? Just waiting for me just to get out of line, just to mess up just one time. And, and, and so I, I, I brought my experience into that scripture. And so I'm going to walk with God, but man, if I'm going to walk with him, I'm, 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 so, I'm so scared because if I if I mess up, he's gonna let the devil get me. Is what he's gonna do, you know? And you 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 feel that when you read that in English, but tamim means come walk with me, walk before my face. Come, let's walk together. And when you do, I'm, uh, tamim means complete, whole, entire, sound, healthful, wholesome, innocent, having integrity. What is complete are entirely in accord with truth and fact. It's like, Abram, you have the potential. There's all this wonderful potential in you, but Babylon has really messed you up bad. You're thinking the wrong stuff. Your game plan's all wrong. You don't even know who you are or what you can do. But if you walk with me, I'm going to bring you to maturity. I'm going to bring out the gifts that I have on the inside of you. There's so much that Babylon suppressed or used for its purposes that I'm going to draw out and I'm going to purify and I'm going to make whole in you. You see, really, in a sense, we need to understand that Adam in the garden, he was pure, but he wasn't perfect. He wasn't mature. He was created in the image of God. He could talk to animals and whatever else. Sometimes you kind of ponder, you know, if he was going to till the garden, how did he do it? He didn't have a tiller. He couldn't run out to the Sears store and get a new tiller. You know, how did he do those things? Because before the fall, it wasn't by the sweat of his brow. Did he use telekinesis? You, I mean, we can speculate all day long until we can find a photograph from back there. We're not going to know, are we? We may find out when we get to heaven. But in all of that, he was still incomplete. He had to have that walk with God. Every, every evening, God would come and walk with him. Can you imagine the, the glory of God coming down and walking with you through the garden? You could share with him. You could ask questions. I found out the Holy Spirit really gets excited when I ask questions. That's very Hebraic. In, in fact, from a, a Semitic mindset, the only way that you can ever communicate with anyone is through questions. And many times, did you ever notice Jesus would answer a question with a question? It wasn't because he was so super smart and he was just talking over their heads. That was the way they communicated. So much so that when he was before the high priest and, and the high priest asked him a question and he answered the question and got hit for it, he basically says, well, I thought we were going to talk. That, that, that's very Hebraic. So much of the word of God is written to get you to ask questions. 
because it's in ferreting out the answer that revelation comes, that wisdom comes. And so Adam tried to circumvent his walk by eating of the tree of good and evil to become something that walking with God to a certain degree could have produced. He went after knowledge. You're walking with the creator of the universe. And you can ask him anything. Nowhere, God just said, don't eat of that fruit. He said, there is no question you can't ask me. We don't find that in the book of Genesis. He could have asked him anything. And in his walking, Adam could have become more. But he chose to walk with another system. I literally believe the, the, tr- the fruit of the tree of good and evil was the seed of Babylon in the earth. He chose Babylon over his walk with God. And so now God finds a man in Babylon and says, come walk with me. I'm going to do some stuff in your life. You see, walking with God is more than just getting saved. How many have realized that? Getting saved is the beginning And some people get saved and just sit down. How many know if a little baby's born and it just sits down, it never grows, it never learns how to walk, it never learns how to run, it never learns how to do anything, we got a problem. Yet for some reason, spiritually, we're satisfied with that in the body of Christ. And to say, that's normal, they're just holding on until the Lord comes back. You know, some say, you know, I break for the rapture. Well, you broke the long, you know, you stopped a long time ago. You're supposed to be moving. Whenever the rapture hits, we're supposed to be faithful when he comes back. We're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be walking with him. And it's only in that walking with God day in and day out. You see, I learned something the other day as I was driving in that truck, that a, a truth that I had known before that maybe I forgot. That in his presence, there's strength and healing. And his presence is not dependent upon how I feel. Because how I felt, I wanted to grab my phone and say, 911, please come have an ambulance, come pick me up. Instead, I started praising and worshiping, and that was a spiritual 911, and Father God showed up, and I got something that an ambulance could have never have given me. See, that's part of walking it out. Then Jesus comes along. Now, let me know that he is almighty God come in the flesh. Jesus is God. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that took on flesh. And the first thing he does, he picks out a bunch of fellows, and he says, come follow me. Come follow me. We miss the whole point of what he said. He said, boys, come walk with me. Now, to the Jewish mind, they went, oh, I'm, if you're Messiah and you're asking me to come walk with you, you're going to reestablish in me what I lost in the garden. And it was so profound that these professional fishermen, that their families counted on that, on that business going in day in and day out, walked away and left everything and followed him. Because what they heard was Almighty God saying, let's take a walk. Let's take a walk. What you really believe, who you really are, is not a demonstration in in, in saying I mean in the right places here or singing in the right places here. It's after you leave here and you pick up your cross and you pick up your Bible and you start walking with God in your day in and day out life. That where where the rubber meets the road is where your Christianity is supposed to be led. It's supposed to function there the greatest, not here. This is just a celebration and an impartation of that which we have all week. And I always like to read this uh, in in, uh, Matthew 4, 14. It says, follow me. And he says, I will make you fishers of men. I like to stop before the fishers of men. Now, all the Baptists get all excited about the fishers of men. But we miss where Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you. It's the exact same call that Abraham received in Babylon. The cure for Babylon is quit being religious. Start walking with God in honesty, in integrity. God's real, let's be real with him. Now, 
<clears throat> there's a requirement. And this is an interesting one. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, and then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me or come to follow me, walk, walk with me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And we think of just the Roman cross, but how many know Rome did not invent the crucifixion? I may give a little bit of new news to you. It, it, it can go all the way back to Samarimus. The cross originated in Babylon and those who would try to raise up against Babylon, she feared that the same thing that happened to Nimrod when Seth killed Nimrod over what he had done would happen to her. So she began to do the first strike and hunt them down and crucify them. So to a Jew, when you, when, when you said cross, it went well beyond Rome because Rome was just another spirit of Babylon. It went back to where Jesus was saying, you come follow me, and you begin crucifying the things that can hold you to Babylon. That's part of the walk. Now, how are we going to get this walk right? How am I going to walk with God? You know, my wife and I, we got a pretty good life together. But you know, because of that, one of the things that we, we, we see in Amos 3 says, it says, how can two walk together unless they agree? Well, first of all, it's agree to walk together. And second of all, we've got to agree on things. How many know you got trouble in, mar in your marriage when you're wanting to eat this and she's wanting to eat that and you're wanting to watch this and she's wanting to watch that and you're wanting to do this and she's wanting to do that and, and you just constantly is pulling away. You can't walk together in all those things. It's the same way with God. I have got, my walk has got to be, God is bringing me into agreement with him in at different areas of my life so that I can walk with him because he cannot be involved which, with that which is counter to who he is. I've got to be agreeing with God. So if I, if I want God involved in my finances, I need to find out in the word what it says about finances and begin functioning that way. That way God can walk in it. <clears throat> Same thing about health. You know, the reason I don't eat pork is because God's against it. And I thought it's interesting. I was telling this to Brother Michael that I saw an activist in the gay and lesbian community uh, debating a Christian. And so the Christian brought up the Bible and said, you know, God has said, this is sin. And you know what the guy went straight to? Didn't even blink an eye. He said, do you eat pork? Yes. God says not to eat that either. Well, under the New Testament, he says, well, what makes you think maybe this didn't cover that the New Testament too? I mean, he saw him coming with a big old bullseye. You see, the truth of the matter is, every one of us have a sin that so easily besets us, whether it is a sexual sin, a pride sin, a money sin, whatever sin, all those have got to be crucified with Christ, and I've got to learn how to yield to that and overcome it. I can't just, you know, what if everybody grouped together and, and we had a thieves' guild that are marching in Washington trying to make sure that they overturned all the laws that, uh, that made you go to jail if you stole. Well, we don't like that because that affects all of us, right? So you know, we, we may stand against that one. But it's the same thing. No, the Bible says if you're a Christian, he who stole, let him steal no more. And as I'm walking with God, and as I'm doing these things, I have got to learn to come into agreement with God. God is unmovable. He is unshakable. He is immutable. That means the moment you try to change God, you have created your own idol, and you're serving it instead of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so... Part of me getting the walk right is I've got to learn to come into agreement with God. And what I have found in my life, you know, the Bible talks about if any two touch, touch can agreement is anything that, the, that they, they would have. 
You know, the quickest way to do that, now, husband and wife is really good. They can come into agreement, and, and I've seen God move that way. But I tell you what, when you come into agreement with God, stuff happens. God can come down and move when what you're doing is in agreement. And heaven says, I can endorse that. A lot better than Jesus looking to the Father and saying, please overlook the stupidity Mike is doing right now, and I've got to sit here and intercede for him because the dummy doesn't know that what he's doing I can't be involved in and just give him the grace to get out of this thing and get corrected. I would much rather say, Dad, let's go down there and do something because he's in agreement with us. That's all a part of walking with God. So what, what's, what's, the, what's the first thing of learning to walk right with God? Study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now here is one, even around here, with the type of sermons I preach. Listening to a sermon is not study. I am your supplement dealer. I supplement That's all I can do. I can supplement. Now, living on supplements is a way to get sick if you don't eat anything else. The only way that you can get the meat of the word is you've got to go to the book yourself. You've got to crack the book, open it up, and read it. And as you do, God will start talking to you through his word. Now, I may, I may set some of the, the groundwork to where you can start connecting the dots and you can start following those dots and see how they're connecting and then all of a sudden, you start connecting some more. I have demanded of myself that I read so much of Scripture every day just to see. And I, I tell you, the, the Word of God is living. It's powerful. When God said that, he wasn't kidding in the book of Hebrews. I have had scriptures that I have read over literally thousands of times. And here Dr. Lake is reading a scripture that he has preached from a thousand times. And I see something it never said before. And the devil used to beat me up and say, well, see how stupid you are. You're going around saying that you're a doctor and you don't even know this. When in truthfully, then the Holy Spirit says, now, Mike. Because really, in, in, in Hebrew, when you become a doctor like Paul was, in, in, you know, in, in a Greco-Roman mindset, I've arrived. For a Hebrew, for a rabbi, you're a master learner. You finally get to the place where you can learn. He said, Mike, you just finally got to the place where you can learn now. And I'm showing you stuff. And this is applicable to what's going on right now. And it, it came alive from the word. And if I would not have cracked the book, I wouldn't have got it. And your Bible needs to become personally. This, uh, this is the one I've, I've had to kind of graduate from it. I, I used to love the... Uh, the open Bible, King James Version, because I've been preaching out of it since I was 13. Uh, number one, they quit printing it in, in what I call premium leather and all that stuff to where if I don't, the Bible won't hold together. But for some reason, the print keeps on shrinking on the thing. And so I, I found this one that has bigger print on it, and, I'm, and it, it becomes a roadmap to me that as I read, I know I've highlighted and I've underlined stuff on this page, and I've written some notes over here, and it becomes a roadmap for me. And sometimes when I'm traveling, this big old honking thing is usually hard to carry with everything else I got when I travel on the road, and so I've got a, a, a thin, large note edition that's about this thick. Uh, but I get aggravated because the words of God are there, but my map's not there. My notes aren't there. It's like I'm, I'm thinking I, I want to preach on something, and you're in the pulpit, and you try to flip it over, and somebody stole my highlights because it, it becomes personal to me. Don't be afraid to write in your Bible. Don't be afraid to underline in it. Don't be afraid to make notes on the side of it when God inspires you because it, it becomes a roadmap to you and uh, I've, had, I've had people, in, when I was in Germany, that I, I was doing that. I was, in, I was single in the military. I had plenty of time to get in the book. And so one of our favorite things to do during study time is we would switch Bibles so that we could see what their notes were and what they highlighted and how to compare to what our notes were and what we highlighted. 
to see, you know, what, what was God emphasizing to you when you read that scripture? And then sometimes we would talk almost to midnight just talking about the highlights and the underlines and, and what was significant to you and why was it significant to you and why, why was God sharing that? We were sharing our maps and it kind of, you know, whenever you travel, you always have your, fi- your favorite diner. You always have your favorite place to stop, and, and you're kind of like Brother Looper when uh, he was getting ready to pick me up at the airport here a couple weeks ago at, uh, at Atlanta, and there's a, like a two-hour drive between there and Cleveland. He said, Brother Mike, he said, I want you to know that I charted the course, and there are eight cheesecake factories between the, the airport and Cleveland. Which one you want to stop at? I mean, he already he had all that laid out because he knows I like the cheesecake factory. You see, each one of us have that. We can mark it in our Bibles. I've had people get mad at me and say, you wrote all over your Bible. Uh-huh. God's talking to me, and I, I don't know about you, but if I don't write it down, if I don't underline it, if I don't make notes, I'll forget. It's God talking to you. And when the king of the universe starts talking to you, you, may, you might want to take note of it. I've had God tell me some things in the midnight hour when I was, I was so low I had to look up to see the bottom of a worm. But yet I have had him when I went to the word give me the answer to my situation. And sometimes it was scriptures that I had just preached the week before to show you how the uh, honoriness of God. You just preached it last week, but I'm going to show you how to use what you just preached and I'm going to show you something you didn't see to get you out of what you didn't even know you were in. That's God. So we need to study. You see, because Babylon is not a location. It's a way of living. It's a way of thinking. It is something that you trust in other than the kingdom of God. <coughs> and so the only way, the first place you leave Babylon is between your two ears. And all the world around us is teaching us this is the way of Babylon. You got to do this. You got to do it this way. You got to think this. How many are realizing we, we have we have thought Nazis all over the place right now in America, and some of it has really gotten kind of we we are generating absolute fear over guns. In America, now I'm, I'm military. I mean, I, I can strip down an M16 and put it together in my sleep. You treat it with respect, but you don't teach fear. There's, see, there's another agenda going on the way of Babylon. When you take all the guns, nobody can eject to Babylon. Okay? There was a time. Why, why am I, even before I went in the military, my uncle taught Boy Scouts how to shoot guns. And so I was around guns, and I, would, I shot 22s and all these different things. I wasn't afraid of it even before I went in the military. I respected it. In America, there was a time that... One through, one through six elementary school, part of the training was to shoot their weapons. They had marksmanship in first, second, third grade in America. Why? Because all the kids carried their guns to school. In fact, the, the first supposed possible gun shooting at school in America was stopped by the students because a guy had it at Hodds with... Uh, with, his, with one of the teachers, and he went to the school to shoot the teacher, and he pulled out his gun, and all the kids pulled out theirs and said, we like our teacher. You better not do it. <laughs> Just a thought, okay? But we're, 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 we're being taught to be afraid of the fear, 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 fear this. Terrorism. It's a war on terror. It's a war on terror. And yet at the same time, what I'm seeing, guys, and this is what's really concerning me. I mean, no, two years ago, this, this is the way Babylon works. Two years ago in Missouri, there was, two or three years, there was a think tank in Missouri that came up with this thing on terrorism. And they gave it to the governor. Governor released it to the, to the State Department. And uh, in it, it had something called an alias terrorist. And so what comes to mind is you ask, what is an alias terrorist? Why, it's a terrorist that don't know that they're a terrorist. How many know every Muslim exp- extremist know that they're a terrorist? But their definition of a terrorist is somebody who takes this book literally. Well, that's about every Christian I know. And they really pay a lot of attention to the book of Revelation. That raised such a scandal nationwide that our governor pulled the report. 
two weeks ago in Colorado. And it's actually the Colorado State Troopers that brought it to the press. Our Homeland Security Department came and did, did a, a pre- preparation for terrorism. And they have something called sovereign citizens. See, they changed the name. Well, what's a sovereign citizen? Well, a sovereign citizen is someone under the delusion that God had a hand in establishing this nation. And that he takes the word of God seriously. We would call them fundamental Christians. Well, about 90% of the straight troopers say, well, then we're terrorists. <laughs> can, can you see the, the shift that Babylon is doing? They're afraid of this. They're afraid of you getting into this and start actually walking with God because you can't walk with God and walk with Babylon. But the good news is you can't walk with Babylon if you're walking with God. They're afraid of this. It is time for us to get back in the word of God to show you the difference. How many know that Harvard has kind of gone the way of the progressive liberal? Harvard at its foundation to, to become a student at Harvard. You had to prove your devoutness as a believer. You had, part of your daily routine was to at least seek the face of God three times a day and to spend time in the Word. And you had to show proficiency in Greek and Hebrew just to get in. You, you had to do that before you got in. Now, I mean, that would be, that, I mean, that's a little bit beyond the SAT scores, Okay. The average inductee was 13 years of age. Devout believer, proficient in Greek and Hebrew. We have a lot of 13-year-olds that are not proficient in English. You see, if Darwin was right and we're evolving, the truth of the matter is we have been de-evolving for the last couple of hundred years. So this evolutionary thing is getting wonky, isn't it? It's going back, going forward, going back. The whole time that we're going backwards, they're telling us we're going forward. I think it's a whole fairy tale. That's just my opinion. The second thing is prayer. Now, I'm talking beyond the prayer of, God, here's all the stuff I need. Here's all the stuff I want you involved in. Or how about taking authority? <laughs> I remember the story of Jesse Duplantis. He woke up and he was in a hotel room and there was a shadow of a figure over in the corner. He stuck his little finger out of the corner, out of the covers. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I take authority and it wouldn't move. I take authority. And for two hours, he did that until the sun come up and realized it was his coat on the hat rack. <laughs> and see, many times we're kind of like that. We, we, we want to take authority And we do those kind of prayers when the highest form of prayer is this talking things out with God. I mean, going beyond your want list, going beyond your need list. God, it's not like, God, I just need more money this week. You need to get past all that to start really dealing with you. There is a branch of psychology called Rogerian psychology. And, you know, we can get into the the archetypes and all these different things, and I want to get into that. But one of the things that a a Rogerian psychologist will do is you'll say, I really feel depressed. Well, Mike, what I hear you saying is you really feel depressed. I'm mad about it. Well, Mike, what I really hear is that you're depressed and that you're mad about it. $200 an hour for this. But see, what, what Rogerian psychology mirrors back what you said because they think the answer is already within you and as you ferret some stuff out and and get it expressed, you're going to stumble across the answer. And so his job is just to keep you talking. And at $200 an hour, how many know that's not a bad job for him? But you see, there is a physician whose name is Jesus. And I can go, and what I have found is when I really start talking out things with him. You see, there's a reason why God loved David. And it wasn't because he was perfect. How I many know David wasn't perfect? It, it wasn't that he killed thousands of Philistines and all these different things that God called him a man after his own heart. 
David shared everything with God. When, when David was mad, he said, God, I'm mad. I really wish you'd come down and just knock their teeth out. That's the kind of mad that I am right now. And when he was happy, he would dance until all he had left was his BVDs when they brought in the Ark of the Covenant. He held nothing back from God except Bathsheba. The one thing he did not talk with God about. And it cost him, he wasn't able to build a temple, not because of his affair with Bathsheba, it's because to cover up his own sin, he set up a righteous man to die to cover up his sin. God didn't say, I won't let you build my temple because you're an adulterer. He said, I won't let you build it because there's blood on your hands. That was the only time in David's life he did not go and grab the horns of the altar and pray it through. And see, I think praying that through is a part of our walking with God. God, I don't understand. I'm confused. I'm dazed. Uh, I'm, I'm angry. And I begin really talking it out with God. And therapist Jesus sits down and begins helping me work with my issues. And out of my heart begins to spring. Oh, because guys, I've been in situations that were, it's like you're, you know, here's normal and the pressure's about up here. And over that's when the top of the ceiling busts and your head explodes and you're just kind of bouncing on it every once in a while. And I'm right here. And this situation is intolerable. And I'm seeking God. And oh, God, I just can't take it anymore. And God deals with something over here that really has nothing to deal with this but has to do with how I'm responding to this. And the moment I say, oh, okay, well, Lord, this just changed into my life. I go, all the pressure goes down. Sometimes he doesn't change the situation. He'll change you in the situation. But I have found that only happens when I'll go and I'll just start pouring out my heart to God. I, I, I don't try to get religious about it. I don't do the King James Elizabethan, O Lord, if that sitteth in heaveneth. You know, so, Daddy, I've had enough. I need to get to the bottom of this thing. And I just really start sharing my heart. And I'll, and I'll say, I know I shouldn't feel like this, but I do. Help me change my point of view. Help me. Help me. Is, is there something that I'm missing? And I've had the Holy Spirit bring up stuff that I forgot ever happened. You ever had God do that? Stuff. Yeah, I was six years old, and Jimmy did this to me, and it made me mad, and I never forgave him, and I've held a grudge, and that kind of built on this, and built on this, and built on this, and built on this, and all of a sudden, God says, you know, remember that with Jimmy? Why don't you just go ahead and forgive him, ask, ask the blood of Jesus to cover that. When you do, all this that was built on that just falls apart. Because I find a lot of things, if God doesn't know, if I don't pray through now, the old time is just called pray through when you feel like you got the answer from heaven. I think sometimes praying through is praying through your issues so that as you're working that through with God, God can bring you to maturity. I'm finding out the same thing with grace. Now, grace, its, it's basic elemental definition is unmerited favor. Whether it's the, the Greek word or chesed in, in Hebrew, unmerited favor, and that is one dimension. And I, I, I want to say this, and I want to say it carefully so that you understand me. That is grace in its immature position. It always grows into something greater. It starts as a seed that's planted as it begins to come up through the ground, you get this unmerited favor from God. You can get the forgiveness of sins. And God begin, you begin to find out that God loves you even while you were yet a sinner. But as that thing matures, it now becomes the power of God in your life to give you strength to crucify the flesh and overcome Babylon. And so what we are doing today is we have entire movements that are based upon immature baby grace. Baby grace ain't going to cut it with what's coming. As I let God work, work through my issues with me, he begins working the kingdom in me. And I become more than I used to be. 
Now, my family will tell you the old Mike Lake that I used to be is primarily dead. Now, every once in a while, he'll try to pull himself up off the cross and show his ugly head a little bit, and, and I or Mary will have to beat him back down. Steffi laughs. But we all go through that. But uh, it, it, it's like her and I were talking the other day, and she said, you know, finally, you, you grew up to be the man I knew you could be. You see, there, there's this growing up. Growing up that needs to go on. I need to grow in grace. I need to grow in God. And as I do, I put away childish things. How many know pouting all the time is a childish thing? Yeah, oh man. Holding a grudge all the time is a childish thing. There's a lot of things you do as a little kid that's okay when you're little. But if you had a 14 or a 40-year-old doing the same thing, how many know we got a problem? And yet emotionally, we have people that are acting like four and five-year-olds and it's destroying their life. And God says, if you would ever let me in there, I could bring healing and restoration so that I can mature you because the only way you can reach your potential is with God, walking with him. University can't do it. And here's the kicker. They'll charge you up to $900 a credit hour for something they can't do. That's a supplement. And if you take God out of the equation, it doesn't work at all. That's why there was Occupy Wall Street. And, and actually, it was not an indictment upon the corporate America. It was an indictment on the universities because they promised all these guys that all this stuff was going to happen if they took their classes and at $900 a credit hour, and then none of it ever happened there now there there are guys coming out of universities that are a half million dollars in debt and can't find a job. And the reason they're a half million dollars in debt is because the university said you take these courses, get this degree and you'll get a good job. I knew one man one time that was a millionaire. Barely a high school graduate. And he, he uh, I was joking with him on the phone. He said, Mike, he said, you know, he said, he said, I'm not educated like you. He said, I just got money. And he said, I finally discovered what God wanted me to do in the earth. And I said, well, what did he want you to do? He said, uh, he said I'm here in the earth to give degrees to all the guys that went to university. <laughs> or to give jobs to all the guys that went into university. He said, if it wasn't for guys like me, they wouldn't find any work. But the man walked with God. Because we're finding out, I mean, there's something called IQ, intelligence quota. They're finding out there's something much more important. You can have average intelligence, but have a high EQ, emotional quota. Your EQ, about how, how much you have matured on here, you can take someone that's just an IQ of 100 and can thrive and leave all the geniuses in the dust because he has the maturity. He knows when to hold them. He knows when to fold them. He knows how to deal with relationships. You know, it's like watching the guys on Big Bang Theory. It's scary to me that these the guys like that have laboratories they can go into and lasers they can play with. They always joke about one character. Sheldon said, you know, don't mess with him because he's just, he's this one push from being over an evil villain, you know, an evil scientist. And we, we have guys like that that can have a super high IQ, but they, they can't have relationships, they can't relate to anything in life, and therefore they don't thrive at all. And God is saying, I can come in and I don't necessarily need to work on your IQ. You don't need to be smarter. You need to be more mature. So we need to learn to walk these things out with God. And the third one, so study, pray, the third one, do. If you do the things that I tell you, Jesus said, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Sometimes, guys, the only way of really understanding what God meant was to experience it. It's kind of like riding a bike. I remember when I was a kid and I was riding a bike and they, they got to the place where they wanted to take off the training wheels. Can, some of us are a little, that's been a while back. And you see all the other kids riding in the neighborhood and, 
and none of them have training wheels, and I got these training wheels on, and boy, they're safety. And, you, and you know, it's like, okay, I'm a big boy now. I'm going to take off them training wheels, but I can't imagine how that, it's like, maybe if I just go fast enough, you know, but, you know, they're going slow, and they can, they can stay steady. What's, what is this? It's like the first time they, they, they take them off and the first time you actually get it going and you understand the balance. You can't explain it to somebody. You can't lecture it to somebody. The moment that you experience it, you learn it. That's the way it is with a lot of things in life. Why does God say to do the things the way he says to do them? To me, sometimes they, it seems odd. It seems strange to do them maybe the way God said to do them. But I have found out that when I go ahead and do them, it always works. That's why James said, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. I like to say it this way. When you do the word, the word will work. If you're not doing it, it won't work. You can hold a can and you can place it in the, in, the, in the vicinity of a can opener. How many know that you're not going to eat? You've got to actually put it in the can opener and work the can opener. And when you do, you can get to the contents. And so all the promises of God, there is a doing that comes out of the walking that when you walk and do, God will always do what he promised. These three simple things. Everybody always says, you know, Mike Lake always teaches way over my head. These three simple things, study, pray, and do, will get you through the tribulation period. It'll get you through whatever you're going through now. It'll get you to where you have some life in your life. You see, I just don't want to live to be old. I want to have some life in my days. I got some stuff I'm wanting to do for God. I want to have some joy in there. I want to have some peace in there. I want, to, I want to have some things that just make me look back and say, boy, I'm really glad I lived and I did that. <clears throat> Before I was just getting by, but I, my testimony is, since I've walked with God, I can walk out of hell with God and enjoy the journey. I've walked through hell. I've walked out of hell. I've walked through where people were trying to physically kill me. And at the same time, I had joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I had peace that passes understanding because I was walking with the Holy One of Israel. And as I look behind, he was having me empty my pockets as I was walking with him. You know why? The things that God has you get rid of are the very things that there's a homing beacon in that the devil uses to attack your life. Let's throw away every weight that so easily besets us. I think if the apostle Paul had where he could write, re, you know, write it today, he would say that the devil has smuggled homing devices, GPS devices in your sin so that he can home in on you and attack you. If you get rid of it, he can't find you because you're supposed to be hidden in God. That's a little techno babble there for the younger ones of us. Get rid of the wiretaps. Get rid of the stuff the devil's infiltrated in your life so that he can get you. Just start walking with God. And, start, and if you empty your pockets... I found this out too. You have room for stuff in your pockets. You can start putting the kingdom there. Start putting a little wholeness there. Put a little joy where it used to be sad. Put a little happiness where it used to be mad. A little self-confidence in you where you were, had no confidence because you found out what God thought about you. When you discover who you are in God... The man or woman will finally raise up that can look the, eye, the devil in the eye and say, you'll go no further. We see it in the life of Abram. He let Egypt shake him to the core where he said, this is my sister. That's the worst thing you want to say about your wife. She's my sister. You want to date her? You, know. <laughs> you don't do that. To where he had four kings take his family hostage when they took Sodom and Gomorrah, and he said, round up the boys. We're going to open up a can of whoop king tonight. How many know in, in, in between that process, he discovered who he was in the Almighty, 
And as soon as he did and proved it, Melchizedek showed up and gave him communion. And it changed him forever. It was after that that Sarah conceived. That he could let her on believe that Isaac could be rose from the dead when there was no such thing. No one had ever been ro- raised from the dead. There was no concept of it. Yet when he took the communion with Melchizedek, he understood resurrection. And the book of Hebrews says that he was willing to give Isaac because he knew in a shadow that he would see him raised from the dead. That never happened until he really learned who he was and stood in who he was with God. I want to tell you, and I said all that to say this. You are so far short of who you can be, it isn't funny. And if we listen to Babylon, they are going to take you further and further away from your potential. Because Babylon always leads to chains. Babylon always leads to you making bricks for them. Babylon always wants to mold you into something that you're not so they can use you to build something. And God is saying, if you walk away from that and come in me, I will create wholeness and integrity in you and you will be fashioned according to the truth that I had in mind when I created you. And it's a whole lot better than anything Babylon can do. And if you start walking in that, Babylon can't hold you, can't grab you, can't control you. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to come out of Babylon in the days ahead, is to learn to really walk with God. And that's a task you've got to take after you leave here. Got to make yourself pray. Well, I don't feel like praying, Mike. Tell God about it. God, I don't feel like praying. What's a guy to do? Start where you are. If you're honest about where you are, he can take you where you need to be, but you got to be honest. Don't read 500 scriptures this week. Just meditate on one. Pick a good one and just chew it for a while. Chew it all week long and see what God gives you out of it. Just roll it over in your mind. Put it on a little three-by-five card. Pull it out of your pocket. Read it. Meditate on it. And take notes on it on the back side while God shows you. You'd be surprised how much you can chew out of one scripture in a week if you'll just sit there and chew. What God will show you. Just pick one new thing to do. God shows you something, start doing it. Just that one thing. Don't go to a hundred things. One thing Because all of us, change is slow. The devil will try to bombard you with a thousand things that you need to do for God. No, just one. Just one this week. Maybe one the next week. And just be faithful. The just shall prove himself faithful. He shall live by his faithfulness to what God has shown him. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Father, we thank you that your word does not return to you void, but will accomplish where unto you have sent it. And Father, I ask that you have stirred some things in us this morning, that we can shake off the junk of Babylon. And Father, that we can truly pick up the beginning of walking with you, that that halakha would begin to take a hold in our lives, that as we walk, there's a better future, that as we walk, there's a better destiny. As we walk, there's a better version of us just waiting to be released by your presence in our lives. And Father, we thank you this morning. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name.